Hey guys, we had a problem with the video on this episode, so the, only the first 19 minutes uh, recorded. Unfortunately, is with a special guest, my daughter, uh, Grace, came on the podcast to talk about uh, this past year uh, in her life. Uh, we talk about her uh, uh, internship uh, down in Mexico for gap year after graduating high school. Uh, Grace is uh, 19. She likes uh, to to read. She likes music. She likes K-pop music. And you'll hear uh, other things that she's uh, interested in. And we talk about lessons that she's learned, challenges that she overcame, and uh, just kind of how she made the decision uh, to go and, and also her thoughts on, on the future and her thoughts on working with people and, and ministry and, and gap year. So I hope you enjoy this interview with my daughter, Grace, Grace Lynn Joy. Okay. Welcome to the podcast, Grace. Thanks for having me. So for listeners, uh, introduce yourself. T tell us about yourself. Okay. Well, my name is Grace. I am 19 years old. I graduated high school summer of 2022, and I'm starting college in the fall, uh, majoring in psychology, and this is my dad. <laughs> so uh, t tell, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your decision to, uh, well, before uh, deciding to major in psychology, because uh, that, 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 that's been a change. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your life and kind of the decisions you made uh, after high school, going into your decision to go to college. Yes. There's, a, there's a big thing in, the, in between there. <laughs> yes, so right after high school, um, that summer I was getting ready to, to go to college. And I was originally planning on majoring in music therapy. And then an opportunity came up for me to do a, an internship in Central Mexico, teaching English um, to high school, high, middle school, high school, and adults um, with, a, with a Christian nonprofit organization community center there. And uh, things just sort of fell into place it was it's wild all of the different connections that that led me led me to that point but yeah eventually I I think it was about a month before when they contacted me and things sort of fell into place and I was only planning to stay one one trimester three months and I ended up taking a full gap year um teaching the whole school year there and the name of that organization is no way can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, Noe International stands for Nuevos Oportunidades de Educación. So that means new education opportunities. And that's the whole goal of this organization is to serve um, people, you know, students, families, people of all ages in the community, specifically um, and like primarily by providing high quality English classes with, you know, native speakers from um, all different parts of the world. You know, we've, we've had, um, we've had visitors and supporters from, from different parts of the U.S. and Canada and um, lots of different, yeah, it's, it's just a really, a really well put together program. Um, the, specifically with the quality of, of the, of the English program and um, more uniquely because of the exchange program that they have. So there's a four-year English program. And then at the end of that, you have an, an opportunity to um, pretty competitively uh, make your way onto uh, an exchange team where you get to spend a month in, in Oregon, in Portland, or in the surrounding area with a host family there, which is a super valuable experience um, and is an amazing opportunity for for the students there. It, it open it, it has the potential to open up a lot of doors for them, whether it's just through the connections they make there, or um, really that you know having that level of English is like really you know is a really valuable asset moving forward for their careers um, and anything like that that they want to get into. 
Yeah. So your initial plan was to, to go there for, for three months. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to rewind a little bit. You were getting ready to, to go to college uh, fall uh, um, last year. And then a month before school starts, it, it, it changes. So can, can you say a little bit what, what you were thinking and feeling um, uh, about the decision to, to take a, a gap year or delay uh, starting college? Um, and, and, and do you have any like recommendations or advice for anyone who's like wrestling with that decision? Mm, absolutely. Yeah, I... I mean, right, yeah, up into that that point where where I decided to go um, do an internship at Noe, I I very much knew that I was not ready for college, but I was like, well, I guess nobody's ever really ready, right? So we're just gonna have to see how it goes. But like in certain specific areas, I knew that I was not prepared, that I was really worried about, you know, leaving my family and being in a new place. I um, I was in, I was homeschooled until fourth grade and then was in um, a public charter school that was sort of catered towards homeschoolers um, with a lot of the same students. It was K through 12 for, for nine years. So sort of in the same community for most of my life. And um, so, yeah, it, it was definitely, it's like a big, scary new thing to, to go off to college um, and to, you know, to live in a different place. Um, figuring, becoming more independent, figuring out things like, you know, your own transportation and finances and all of that, like scary sounding stuff. Um, but, uh, funnily enough, that's exactly what I ended up like learning and working on a lot while I was away. So it was definitely, you know, exactly what I needed. Best decision I ever made. That's what I always say. <laughs> wow. So like a lot of the things that you were worried about or unsure about you had to figure out and 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 do in a foreign country right. with in, in a different language yeah so it's kind of funny because I was like man I don't feel prepared for college to face all of these things so let me just go instead of you know going a few hours away from my family let me just go like several thousands of like <laughs> thousands of miles away first time leaving the country second time on a plane in my entire life um, and just see how it goes. And, <laughs> but, but the greatest thing is that it was in a very safe and, and supportive community where it's like absolutely like pushing me out of my comfort zone. Um, but, you know, setting me up for success too. And, and I, I want to note that especially after the pandemic, it was, it, there was a lot of that, um, coming out of, of being in isolation for so long, like going from being inside for two and a half years, not really meeting any new people for during that whole period of time either, really, um, or and not interacting with, with people or, or going out and doing different things, being a part of like big events and that sort of stuff um, for a really long time to going down to Mexico and meeting like 200 new people in two weeks. And, you know, every day there's something going on and every day there's like, oh, we have to prepare for this event and you have to plan for this and, you know, arranging all this stuff and being a part of all these different events. It was like <laughs> overwhelming at first, but and, you know, like you have that excitement at the beginning that sort of carries you through with the adrenaline. And then you have that period where it's like, OK, I don't know if I'm able to do this. And then, you know, once you sort of dig in to all the, the challenging parts of that, it's it becomes this really fulfilling, like, okay, I know I can grow from this. And it has changed my perspective on a lot of things. It's, it's definitely helped me be a lot more open and more, just more comfortable in general, talking to new people. Yeah. Well, what, what's one perspective that that's changed for you? One, pers one perspective that's changed. Um, I mean, the way I've grown up, um, the way you guys <laughs> raised me, like family has always been really important. But um, definitely my perspective towards like, maybe not even perspective, but just sort of mm, like how I view and how I approach communication with family and, and navigating relationships in terms of 
of how you prioritize time because in in the U.S. it's and I don't know I, I don't have a lot of experience with the U.S. in general but from what I can say you know growing up in Portland is it's really it's very goal-oriented culture right you know the way you respect people is by showing up on time and you know um completing your transactions and business and everything very efficiently so that way people can get back to doing their own work and being productive right like it's very much there's a big priority on accomplishing goals um and like yeah like meeting thresholds or 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 landmarks and, and that sort of thing I think even even in small talk when you meet people for the first time a lot of a lot of the times you usually talk you end up talking about like um like the first things you tend to talk about is like you know what do you do for work um and then you talk about you know work and career and or 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 even like when you're my age like what what are you going to study like what 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 are your plans for the future right and what what are you working towards almost and there's definitely a lot of that conversation everywhere you go but especially in Mexico there's a lot of priority and just like when you meet a new person it's like a lot more about getting to know that other person like tell me about you know your family how you grew up like where you're coming from it, it's a lot more of that um sort of and and family is, is usually always sort of the the foundation of where you're coming from in Mexico it's it's much more common for you to to continue living with your parents until you are married and that's that's when you leave the house especially since usually when you go to school it's it's very close by and so like and and people don't usually live in dorms or if they do um it's never like attached to the campus it's like different housing that's like sort of except yeah in that area Mm -hmm. yeah but yeah definitely in terms of family and prioritizing time like on the one hand, people will be like, how are you prioritizing time if you say a party starts at 3 p.m. and nobody gets there until 5, right? But um, if you sort of look at things a little bit closer, the reason that that person didn't show up until 5 is because at 3 p.m. they were like, okay, I'm, I'm getting ready for the party. Um, I'm going to get all get together all of this food that I'm that I'm going to take there, right? And then, you know, a family member comes, stops by and is like, hey, I need this for something else that I'm going to. And then you have a, com- you check in with them and you're like, hey, how is um, your cousin doing who was sick a couple weeks ago, you know? And the priority in that moment is like in America would be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm running late because I have to go to this party. You know, we'll talk about that later. But in, in Mexico, the perspective is you're here now. Um, you are my priority, right? And um, I definitely, <laughs> I I definitely had some of those moments where, like, I I would get I would I would get to class and I would run downstairs to grab some materials from my locker in the in the in the teachers lounge, and um, Juan, our director, he would say, "Oh, Grace, um, we have this group of visitors from the U.S. that just came in this morning. Come say hi. Come come meet them." And I'd be like, "Oh, okay, hi, nice to meet you. Can we show you around?" And you know, you have like a maybe a 10, 15 minute conversation. And that happened, and students are sitting in the right? <laughs> and that happened all throughout the year. And the first couple of times it happened, I was like, "Oh, I'm running late to my class." There, you know, like I was thinking, like what was on my mind in that moment was like all the stuff that I need to cover in class that day, and what shenanigans my students would be getting up to while I was not, you know, supervising them. But um closer to the end of uh closer to the to the end of the nine the nine months that I was 10 months that I was there in Mexico um we had one of those groups come in and I and part of it is because I knew my students and they they knew more what to do when they came to our class time but um like I would meet those people and have like a full conversation and genuinely what I was thinking about was like okay it's so great that these people are here how can we bring them more into this community and like maybe even like oh like like I was thinking about oh it would be so great for you to talk with my students um and uh you know we should definitely go out for lunch sometime this week and that sort of thing and it's it has its pros and cons for sure that perspective but overall it's just it's so much less fearful it's so much less anxious it's not about like you don't feel like in every interaction you have 
um in such a busy culture in the u.s like you it, it tends to feel like every time i'm talking with somebody or every time i'm doing something there's something else i needed to be doing or should be doing right and um that pressure is in the back of your mind it's right distracting. right and so there's mm. it, it's just so much more more yeah freeing and healthy <laughs> i think for me at least mm. to to have that mindset of what i'm doing right now is what i need to be doing and i'm going to put my best into that right now so that way I can then, you know, put my best into whatever I'm doing next. Mm -hmm. And if that means sacrificing a little bit of the time for for this other thing I need to do, I will make it work, right? Um, but I'm not going to let that um, negatively impact the people that I'm taking care of now or the interactions that I'm having now. So, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So the um i, I want to hear a, a little bit more about uh, your your teaching uh but 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 yeah, yeah but let's let's talk a little bit about uh the how you made the decision to stay for the full year because your plan was to uh stay for three months and and you stayed with a host family um uh but i think it was like a week or two <laughs> Uh, after I, you were, you were down there that we, we got the phone call or the, the, the WhatsApp that I you wanted to stay the whole time. That. Yeah, there was one. Cause it was, cause I was telling you a story about, about some, about Juan mentioning it, but yeah. Okay. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so yeah, with, with teaching, like, yeah, just to sort of wrap up that, that sort of time thing. Like I had, I had one student. Um, he would stay after class to tell me about just whatever, like different things that he was learning in school or his interest. And there was one point when it was a really busy day and I hadn't like prepped stuff for my class. And I was like actively like making the materials that I needed to do for the class. But then, you know, the student was here and he was talking to me and he was telling me about something he was studying in school um, and something he was having difficulty with, but he was excited about it. And I was like, looking back and forth um trying to finish these materials before my class started and I see my students filing in and they're starting to talk and I'm trying to listen to like everybody at the same time and I'm like oh my goodness how am I going to teach this class but then I realized like okay I could try and do all of these things at the same time and not do any of them well or I could listen to this student right now and give him my full attention and if I do something different in class today I do something different it's not it's not that deep, right? Like it's it's not the end of the world if I don't te if it doesn't turn out exactly how I planned it. And it ended up being a better lesson than I had originally prepared. So, yeah. <laughs> the um yeah, so the decision to to stay was honestly rooted in moments like that where where you feel like what you're doing matters and it's not just about the system, it's not just about going through the motions and cramming the material into your student's head it's about those re relationships like um I don't remember the full motto of the organization but but no internationals little um what's the word yeah like their their like slogan um has a piece of it that says oh yeah it's Christ revealed lives tra lives transformed um and I saw a lot of that um and I'm so glad I stayed because a lot of that happened after that 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 period of time. So how how it all sort of went down is is I arrived and I was like, okay, I'm here just for winter term, right? Or just for fall term. And then I'm gonna start college. And um my dad came down with me um that, those first couple of days um before train before teacher training started and everything. And I remember I remember Juan, um, like, yeah, he, we were, we were having dinner uh, at a restaurant there. We were having some tacos and I just remember, and this is the thing that he always does. And like, if you ask anybody, like they've all, anybody who works there, they've all had the like, well, maybe not all of them. Cause some of them have been there since before he was director, but, um, he's like, puts your, his hand on your shoulder and looks just deep into your soul. And he was like, thank you so much. Like, 
we really appreciate you letting letting your daughter work here like we we're so grateful that you're gonna let us keep her for the whole year and you laughed and it was like kind and it was like in any other circumstance it would have been a joke but he he knew he was like we're gonna ask her to stay the whole year and we're hoping that you will like let her when the time comes right and and they would like they would like joke about it and I would just sort of like awkwardly laugh whenever they brought up that sort of thing it was like oh yeah you're staying the whole year right you're gonna teach the whole year and I was like no just just three months but about yeah so about I mean like a week after after classes started I met all my students I I got a sense for all of the challenges that they were facing behind the scenes that I I wasn't close with them enough yet to get a sense for that but you know I was I was just stepping into relationships with with the fam the host family I was with um meeting all of these teachers and and seeing how much their work mattered to them um and it felt really good to be wor working in such a positive environment um and then seeing all of the potential and like how dedicated the the staff were to to having an impact on these kids lives to to teaching to, to teach them really important value values and um just be there for them and listen to them i was like i i want to be a part of this and realistically there's only so much i can do in three months right and um and then and then i started thinking about it more and i was like do I really want to leave these guys after just three months? Like, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I'm a sucker for, for, for being needed in the community. That makes me feel good. Right. But, <laughs> but also it was, I, I, I knew that, it, that it was, um, that God was wanted me to be a part of what was happening there. And, and that he was, that there was more that he was going to teach me. I think that was what I told you guys when I, about a month in when I finally decided like well I finally decided a month in I didn't officially say that until like December right but but either way I yeah that's okay yeah well, well um I think par part of it was you you went down to teach English mm -hmm. um but then when they found out that you're a musician they asked you to to teach uh a music class mm -hmm. and, and I was I, not ready yeah that at the beginning of the year. yeah and I think part of that was um so so they, they had, took a few weeks to round up some students and some instruments for them to use and then I think one of the things you said is that you didn't want to just start teaching music mm -hmm. and, uh, just for a few months and then leave mm -hmm. so so you wanted to give more time to to, to teach uh that too mm -hmm. Yeah. So, well, so, um, you, you, you studied Spanish at, at school, but then what was it like to go to Mexico and like have a class of students and, and, and teach English and, 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 and learn how to speak Spanish yeah. and com communicate? Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah, to, yeah, so basically moral moral of the story, how how it all ended. I decided to stay because I, I felt like God was more that there was more that God wanted to teach me. Um and I'm so glad I decided to stay because one of like some of the most like impactful and important relationships, um, I didn't even meet those people until like six months in or 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 seven months in, right? So I'm yeah. <laughs> I knew I needed to stay once 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 we, we got we got going again after second semester but yeah with yeah so the whole learning Spanish thing I I started learning Spanish when I was around six years old just with like picture books um and mom's like Spanish dictionary and stuff um and then I took a couple classes in school in elementary school um I think I took maybe one class in middle school and like two in high school and then I took three semesters of it of, in community college my my junior year um online, online during the pandemic yeah but um so it was very like off and on my my sort of Spanish education but for some reason I I stuck with it it was it's it was always so it always um 
in Spanish, we would say me llamó la atención. It like called my attention. It was always um, something that was really fascinating to me. And like, um, and I think part of it was just, you know, the culture, because I, I'm a strong believer that um, you can't study language or if you really want to to reach a level of fluency or like like a, a good, like solid understanding of a language, you can't study the language without studying the culture. Um, and of course, the cultures are so widely different across all of the many countries that speak Spanish. Um, so it was really exciting uh, to to go to Mexico and have a specific cultural experience of, you know, Mexican Spanish and Mexican references and Mexican slang, which was <laughs> so fun to to go down and and learn different ways of of saying things and um my my Spanish when I went down there was very much like textbook generalized Spanish and now I have and now I, I I don't know if I have any sort of accent from from the region where I was in because there's so many different um there were people from all over the place where I was where I was staying anyways but um my the the, the vocabulary I use is very is very much Mexican because that's what they taught me so yeah Speaking of the region you were in, t tell us about Morelia. Tell us about the town you were in. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Morelia is the capital of Michoacan, central Mexico. And it's um, on the map, it's about five hours from Mexico City, I think. Um, about three, four hours from Guadalajara. It's, oh, I don't know how far it is from, from Querétaro. It's it's pretty close. It's in that area. Very. It's like right in the center. Um and apparently it's called like the most Spanish city in Mexico. It has a lot of, it, at least downtown, it has a lot of very traditional um, architecture. And it's an old city. It's like twice, like the city, I don't know about the whole region and everything, but that city has been around for almost twice as long as the entire United States has been a country, um, which is wild to think about so it, it's it's fun being a part of being like walking around there because you see like you see the mixing of just like old like way back history um in in the surroundings and in in the architecture and the environment and like the culture and also like all of this like modern and like very new very like pop culture and like modern times um like even for example like you'll go into this big like sandstone building that's like right next to the big like aqueduct downtown and they have like ikea looking furniture like it's very <laughs> like there's this big like fun mix of of modern and 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 ancient and it's it's reflected in in the people too what what are um some things that you'd like to do in, in your free time in, in Morelia mm. yeah so my my schedule when I was working there I I would start my like work day at like 4 30 is usually when I would have a head over I was um I was living about 10 minute um bus ride from from the school it was like 20 minute walk and I had classes from five to six six to seven and then almost every day we would have um some sort of event so on Mondays we have like Bible study and on Fridays we have youth group on Wednesday we have volleyball practice and then on Tuesday and Thursday we have our adults classes which are later in the evening so I would have my elementary music classes um on Tuesday Thursday and then my adults class in the evenings um from seven to eight so so yeah pretty much every day from like four thirty to eight was was my was my work schedule so that like gave me the whole morning um and all of saturday and sunday all of the weekend to um yeah to explore <laughs> i mostly just sort of went along with with whatever my host family was up to um during that time they um we would we, there was always something going on i i spent most of my time at noe um with different, you know, events or parties that we had. When I arrived in September, September is very big. You know, it's Mexican independence. Um, and especially in, in Morelia, because um, the city, I think 
the city. It's yeah, it's the city's founder's birthday as well. That happens during that time. So big, big parties. Um, bit you know something going downtown, seeing fun stuff there. But um, yeah, I I also spent a lot of free time after sort of like seeing some of the different sites and stuff. I spent a lot of time with um with people from the YWAM base there as well. Um, we would, you know, we would we had we would go and do volleyball on Sundays uh, and, you know, go out for lunch to different places. I would get, I, I, we had like a little tradition. We would get breakfast or lunch with a few of, of my fellow teachers um, every, probably every couple months or, and, and closer to, to the end of the school year, we started doing it like, a, yeah, I think we did it like maybe three or four times throughout the year. But yeah, so that was, you know, just getting together with people. Usually, usually eating food, <laughs> getting together with people and trying oh. different foods. Lots of tacos. Yes. Yeah. So the um, so you 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 taught in uh, after school. Um, what was it like to to teach adults? And and what were some of the um, like the the challenges that 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 you maybe you had to overcome? Oh, absolutely. With teaching. Yeah. Yeah. And my adults thing was, it was, it was very unique, the system that I had because I was teaching fourth year English. Um, and so by then there's not a whole lot of people in the classes. The most people I ever had a class had in a class at one time was 11. And that was when number and like numbers switched around a lot. People switched schedules. Um, so in total across all of my classes throughout the whole year, I had Just four? Yeah, I guess so. Like technically just four students who were like, who would officially be considered adults. And two of them were in my high school classes. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was funny because, um, so yeah, I, and I didn't have, normally people have um, a lot of like, it's, it's a lot of like parents of students or, um, or yeah, or like family members, relatives. To, to uh, learn and speak English better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or like, you know, learning alongside their kids, which is, I think is really cool. Or for work or that sort of thing. Um, one of my one of my students, she, um, she works um, with people, like she, she works for like the accounting um, for, for like a really important business, um, Sinopolis, which is like the big like movie theater company in Mexico. Um, but she like works with their contacts and like their like accounting team in India. And so like the language they have in common is English. So they both, so they're both like working on their English. So that way they have a better mo mode of communication. Right. Um, but even, even her, she's like 24, I think. Oh, maybe I should. <laughs> but like most of my, most of my, like my most of my adult students yeah like three out of the four adult students were in their like early 20s so like still still quite young as well um but definitely older than me which was an interesting experience right. um i mean in 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 some well, in some senses it's easier than when the high school students mm -hmm. because they are they already have the understanding like i'm coming to learn um they've been in the program for a while uh -huh. some of them some of the adult two of the adults who are like just barely um, in their 20s, they had already been taking classes for a long time. So they knew the whole knowing system. They knew, you know, respect and rules and that sort of thing. I, yeah, I didn't have any issues with the adults being like, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, like, I don't want to learn yeah, from from this little 18 year old girl, right? But it was kind of fun seeing the reactions, <laughs> like my first day of class and like meeting some of the parents I think the parents reacted more than the kids did um, when we had our first like parent teacher conference. And I was like, Hey guys, I'm going to be your kids, you know, teacher for the year. I'm 18, which is younger than some of your kids who are here <laughs> taking my class. And you could see, and they're, they're all like, Whoa, like she's little. <laughs> like you had that sense. But, um, and I mean, I think that kind of made it more accessible for, for the classes I was teaching. Like, um, 
especially by the end of the year it felt like we were having a lot of fun and it, we you know very much like equals where we're having a conversation I it, it it um almost too much to the degree where it was hard for me to be like authority figure sometimes to be like hey guys pay attention or you know I need you to stop doing that or like need you to listen to me or you know that, that sort of thing um but yeah I in terms of teaching the adults it was it was a good experience it was it, it was yeah so your, your your mom's a teacher your older sister's a teacher and you you you, you, you well <laughs> you and you've had some leadership like with uh you know in in orchestra um at school and in choir and things like that um but you haven't really like taught a class and you had to come up with your own curriculum for the the music oh, st stuff yeah, that's true. yeah right yeah so has this experience made you think about or want to be a teacher <laughs> yeah so yeah that's definitely yeah I come from family with well and I grew up in helping in ministry too helping out at church helping with VBS um babysitting for bible studies helping on worship team all those sort of things like that's that's very much like I feel very comfortable in that department um but yeah, in terms of like actually teaching, like, and, and I put so much pressure on myself too, because it was their last year of the class. I was like, and, and, and part of me was like, if I don't like explain these really weird English grammar rules to them, like maybe they don't pass this, this, or like get score high enough on this test and they don't have the opportunity to do the exchange program. And I was like, oh no, but you know, I, I figured it out a little bit more near the end of the year. Like there's, you know, there's only so much of that that's my responsibility, right? My responsibility, well, and, and part of it was like, okay, you know, you need to step up and prepare well for your classes. But but more than anything, more than anything, it was just not like like that is your responsibility is to do your best to teach the class and you know, be available and um let them know that they're able to, you know, be open so that way they know they can come to you for help and that sort of thing. Um and then other than that, it's, you know, it's up to them, um, the level of success that they want to reach. And, and you know, they have support from all different areas in the way, too, um, from from other teachers, from their friends, um, from the leaders in, in the youth group and the Bible study. So, yeah, in, in terms of teaching, um, I, 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 I have this sort of weird, is it? is it dichotomy? I don't, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but I have the one side of me where I've based a lot of my identity on who my family is. Like growing up, I've always wanted to be like my older brother. I've always looked up to my family and wanted to, to sort of like mold myself after these really good things that I admire about my family. Right. Um, and sometimes maybe I base that a little bit too much on that. Like I put too much pressure on myself when I don't line up with that. Or it's really scary to to make choices that are different than than what is normal in my family, um, or not normal, but like what has um, just what we have. What is like what is gen? What is like across the board similar, right? Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, and also. Um, especially when it came to like deciding about college and that sort of thing like very much not wanting to be like not wanting to follow that same path and do the same things as my family because I'm like well no I like I think and that's part of like realizing that I am a different person um, but yeah like sort of like swinging between the two between so I was like for a long time I was very much like yeah no I don't think I'm ever going to study you know theology or um, I don't know, apologetics or anything like that. Like, that's not my thing. Like the Bible scholar type thing that's never been, you know, or like even like missionary mama things like that's, that's JJ's department. Like that's, that's not my personality. That's just not how God's going to use me. Um, and I very much had a period of time where I was considering becoming a missionary while I was down there. Like I was, um, 
uh, some of my friends from the YWAM base had invited me to some of their Bible classes and, and, you know, seeing, um, how they live their lives and the way they make, you know, ministry and evangelism part of everything they do. And they're just so brave and comfortable with how they talk about their faith with other people. Like it's, it's like, they are one and the same with those things, right? Like there's no, it feels like there's no conflict or awkwardness there where they're like, this is who I am. This is a part of me. And I, I admire so much that I was like, I want that freedom. I want that openness to talk about other people. And also like, that's a really powerful way of, of living, you know, to, of serving God in that way. Um, and so, but I definitely had to come to grips with that of like, okay, I should not just discount things just because um, like, it might not look exactly like my brother, or I don't think that that's who, like a part of my personality, like being okay with being similar and also being okay with, with not being the same. So in terms of teaching, I've, I've always said this like, no, I don't think I would be a good teacher. And I, you know, to this day, like when I started, I was like, yeah, I'm not good at this. <laughs> I feel like it's weird for me to to give presentations and stuff. I, and, but, but most of it was because I had this very specific idea of what I thought teaching needed to be. Um, and it was not like for me to be a good teacher to them meant I needed to do different things maybe it wasn't necessarily like the best teaching ever but it was the best teacher I could be um like I gave one powerpoint presentation once in my first class and it was so uncomfortable and I was like I don't and part of it was because I didn't spend a lot of time on it but I also realized pretty quickly I was like I, I don't have, pra I'm not, I'm like, I don't have practice with this and I'm not good at this. I should be using what I'm good at, which is like, you know, drawing things out while I'm talking or having conversations or, you know, having group activities and dynamics and, you know, like having games. Like what I figured out that worked to like make them talk was not like trying to figure out how to set up um, a game or like use the, you know, I, I didn't use the screen so much, which part of me regrets like not um taking on that skill like taking on the challenge of learning that but um press for time I had to, <laughs> to use what I I was better at and um which I can say now because it worked for me was you know like drawing people out and trying to get them to talk with each other right like instead of making the focus like you give me answers like trying to get them to talk to each other um which I think is um more productive when it comes to learning a language too because and part of it is because in Mexico it's like nobody wants to like talk and raise their hand and talk in front of the class and and you know they get a little bit more engaged and they get a little bit more excited as time goes on and they've a lot of them had been taking classes for many years so they know how it works but there are there's always a bit more um comfortability um talking with your with your classmate who is also um in their fourth year of learning English and you know studying the same things as you as opposed to the native English speaker who you have not known for more than a month right so it's yeah so there's definitely that level of I think trust that helps them because learning a language is a very vulnerable thing like you're gonna mess up you're gonna say things wrong you're gonna sound funny um and that's and it, it's hard to push through that sometimes um so like I, you know, I just, I looked, I looked up to my students in so many ways because of how committed they were, um, to, to get to reaching that level of, of like excellence when it came to their English, because I mean, some of the grammar stuff that I taught to them, I was like, I've never heard of this in my life. I, <laughs> I've been saying this wrong my whole life. Right. <laughs> so, so I like, I learned more English the, during that period of time. Yeah. And, and I mean, yeah, in terms of the, yeah, in terms of, do, do I want to be a teacher? Every time people would ask that, I would be like, no, I'm, I, I don't want to be a teacher. I'm so sure I want to be a teacher. Um, but I've always had this feeling, it's like, I don't want to be a teacher. And also I feel like I might end up being a teacher <laughs> because, <laughs> but that's just because like, that's what I've ended up doing a lot. Um, and um, 
I, I can't deny that what I was doing there was very fulfilling for me. Like it was, you know, it was, I, I loved what I was doing. Um, so how much of that was because I was teaching, right? Like for me, what I, what I think, and I'm, I'm, you know, I have, I have, you know, I'm biased towards that point where it's like, no, I don't really want to be a teacher. Um, where, you know, I'll look at, I'll look back on the past year and say like, well, my favorite parts and what was like most, you know, what filled me with the most joy and felt like I was serving the best was everything outside of the classroom, you know, conversations between classes or, you know, helping with um, Bible study and youth group or, you know, playing volleyball with, with people and getting to know them, taking people out for coffee and finding out more about their life and their listening to their stories um, just like doing life with other people. And that's why I got, I was seriously considering the whole missionary thing. And um, because <laughs> I remember mentioning that to one of my friends and they're like, you could do that for your job. You could just, you know, spend time with people and tell them about, G- about Jesus and like <laughs> build relationships with people. And I mean, Hey, it doesn't, doesn't sound so bad. So <laughs> the, um, you, so you, you mentioned that dichotomy. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm wondering what um what is something that you you you've learned uh, about yourself, mm-hmm. or or maybe even on a deeper level, mm-hmm. you know um what what is more clear to you, um, if not whether or not you're you're going to be a teacher, um yeah what what did you learn about yourself? Yeah, so I, I I think I've said this a couple of different times to different people about about my experiences while I was there. Um, I feel like I changed a lot. Like I'm definitely, I mean, I'm definitely a different person than I was um, before I left. And I feel like um, I describe describe uh, the, the, who who you were or the person you were, and then how are you different? Mm, okay. Okay, <laughs> so I, I'm i an ambivert, I guess we could say. It's like 50-50 split. I don't know. The test that I took said, like, you're a 51% introvert and 49% extrovert. I don't know how true that is now. I retook the, I retook the five love languages um, quiz um, six months into living in Mexico. And the percentages were so different because before, like, I think I took it like just after my 16th birthday or maybe my my 17th birthday during the pandemic. Um, and like quality time was definitely the first one. And then acts of service and then words of affirmation, physical touch, and then giving gifts was like a smaller one, giving, receiving gifts. Um, uh, and now it's like, and, and it was like pretty even amount, like big chunk quality time, slightly smaller chunk acts of service um and then and then words of affirmation was about the same size and then it's like a little sliver for the giving gifts and now it's like physical affection like <laughs> like big one um and then uh and then right after that is is quality time um words of affirmation and then acts of service and and giving gifts um right and and i was like okay that's really interesting because I know that my mom's love language is is acts of service, and um, there wasn't a whole lot of physical touch that was happening during the pandemic for anybody, right? Unless you were like living with people that you were really close with, and you know, we we gave each other hugs all the time, so I wasn't like lacking in that sense. But, um, but not from forty people a day, right? Or as a form of expressing affection to other people, I wasn't practicing that, right? Um, yeah, and I had just never been in a culture where it was like, you hug people all the time, <laughs> and I was like, this is amazing, it was like this, it was like this whole new world was opened up to me, where it's like, um, yeah, I don't know, uh, because <laughs> sometimes it's really hard for me to communicate things, yeah. and so being able to just be like, I'm gonna hug you, and hopefully we reach an understanding, like, that was super valuable especially when you're literally like language barrier I don't know how to explain to you what I'm feeling or thinking right now but I want you to know that I care about you can I just like give you a hug 
I, I, they give good hugs at Eastside Imago Day Church. Oh, yeah. Well, and that was the first. That was some of the first steps out of that. Yeah. Like our church that we used to go to before was not like that at all. <laughs> I mean, like hugs felt like a very special occasion. I guess. I guess that's what I would say. Yeah. And like hugs are still still super special and important to me in that sense. Where it's like, like it, it has. It's not like the value of it has gone down for me. But um. I don't know. There's just, there's a lot of, it feels good. It's a, it's a, it's a part of me that like is, is really important to me. Um, so, so that's something you've learned. What's something that was, was healing and helpful for you? Healing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, just anxiety, social anxiety. I, yeah, <laughs> I will, <laughs> what is it like? Name it and claim it. Like, <laughs> You don't have to say the whole thing, but, but, but maybe give a little context. What, what, uh, what has social anxiety like looked like for you, and then and then and then what what was helpful? Yeah, absolutely. I I mean, maybe a pandemic. Everybody, yeah, everybody, every. If I think everybody under the age, well, and I I'm I'm just gonna say what, what I know of demograph of of the people that I talk to because I haven't talked to. A lot of people about this but at least everybody that i knew know who is like under the age of 18 during the pandemic there's so much fear um when it comes to talking to new people when it comes to being in a new environment especially because we've been in this place where it's like we are literally like everybody was saying it is not safe to be in a new place you know, you need to protect yourself. You need to have this like barrier between you and other people in order to take care of yourself. Um, and that's psychologically damaging for for humans who are really social and really um, thrive on being in community. And also just in general, especially, you know, Christians like, um, you know, we're called to be in community and, and support one another in that way and so it's really hard to do that from a distance and, and to be like I'm here for you and I love you and also I have to keep you physically apart and also with that comes just you know just like mentally like that um you, you know it becomes not just the physical thing it becomes that that sort like you're, when, you, when you're con yeah when you're constantly keeping that in mind it becomes an emotional barrier as well I mean, not just the physical separation, but but even during the pandemic, um, not showing yourself on a Zoom screen came to mean or represent like safety. Mm -hmm. But but so safety, yes, but also just more isolation and not being seen, mm -hmm. just being really disconnected. Yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. oh, and it's so weird because. I don't know, like middle school and high school is a time when people are finding, like learning a lot of things about themselves by seeing people around them. Like they see people experimenting and they're like, okay, I like that. I don't like that. Um, and they're sort of finding out, you know, what they're, who they're going to be, what they're interested, you know, exploring their interests and that sort of thing. And when you're just alone with yourself and the internet or like, you know, your family, whatever your family environment is, um, it's you just feel sort of stagnant like I and that's part of why I felt so underprepared um to go to, to, go to college because there's yeah it felt like you know I, I had missed out on the two years of like learning how to like of growth in terms of like gradually becoming more independent like learning how to drive and just starting that whole process or you know getting a job and um and what that whole that whole thing entails um you know just those different sort of like outer worlds <laughs> if we can call it that like experiences that help you navigate um the world yeah like and different communities better um because the truth of the matter is you probably won't be in the same place for the, for the entirety of your life you will have to, you know, tr transition between different places. And if you've never done that before, um, or if the only experience you have with that is like um, exiting communities and not like, and like, it can feel really daunting, um, even the tiniest things. 
because if Um, when you're so, you know, like isolated, um, starting a new class can feel like entering a room of like a thousand people, right? Because, because it's like so new and it's so overwhelming. Um, and, um, every, you know, daily life, like going to the grocery store, or, you know, applying for a job, um, just interacting with coworkers at work, um, especially, you know, most jobs require you to talk with like random strangers during the day, right? And that kind of thing, like all of those are like stepping into like different, you know, interactions, right? It's like, like we can see that almost as like stepping into a room with, with new people, right? And when you're so closed off for so long, and like literally just like not used to physically being around other people each of those feels like 10 times the amount of people 10 times the amount of pressure um and so it's yeah it's it's it can be really paralyzing for some people i think because you know it's just like it's all so overwhelming and it's like well if i can't even do this like how am i gonna do all of these other things how you know if i can't make you know if I can't like make friends with my classmates like how am I gonna you know have like a how am I gonna connect with people at church and that sort of thing so yeah <laughs> to your question well, what was the question <laughs> well, well well so you described like uh how the pandemic could make some social anxiety worse mm -hmm. uh, but for you specifically um uh what what was helpful yeah I mean in regards to anxiety what was honestly most helpful for me was to just get out of where I was like being by myself with my anxiety was never a good thing like there were sometimes when I was like overstimulated and I needed um to remove some of the like overwhelming things um you you, you mentioned uh like one one thing you would cope that helped you cope or 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 manage that like when you would go to gatherings that it's okay to to like take take a nap or something can you, can you explain that oh my goodness <laughs> yes no absolutely actually because it became this whole running joke because like the first month that I was in Mexico every single event that I went to that was like not like every time I left the house I fell asleep wherever I was at for at least 20 minutes <laughs> And like, <laughs> I think the first time we went to church, like we went to um, one of like a couple who who's who lives there, like we went we went over to their house. And like, when you visit somebody's house in Mexico, it's like for the rest of the day. So we were there for like, maybe five hours. And like, after an hour or two, I was like, I'm really tired. And I was like sitting on the floor. And then I had fall. I woke up and I had fallen asleep, just like flat plank, like flat on my back on the floor in front of the couch, like not even on the couch, just flat on the floor. And I was like, at first I woke up and I was like, oh no, this is so embarrassing. I fell asleep on the floor. And then I looked around and everybody was, you know, like everybody's like a bunch of people were sitting on the couch playing um, video games and other people were in a different room playing board games and like, you know, different people were talking and I was like, oh, I just fell asleep on the floor. And everybody seems completely fine with that. Like, no, like everybody has gone about their business. Nobody came and woke me up um, and nobody has made comments on it yet. Like I woke up and it seems like everything's going fine. Um, and so I was like, I guess that's okay then. <laughs> um, and I guess I didn't, I don't know. I was, I was a bit embarrassed about it at first. Um, but I mean, part of it was because like, when you when you're in a new environment like that and you're learning a new language it's just so mentally taxing like you have to you have to rest whenever you get the chance right and especially as and as a sort of as a part-time introvert um <laughs> it's it's helpful for me to just sort of take advantage of any time i have to recharge even if it's during you, the you event met, you met dozens or hundreds of people in the first couple of weeks it was a lot Coming back, I realized just how much information I have, like, discarded in order to take on the amount of, like, names and 
people that I that I met. Yeah. Brain space. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. There was this. I mean, the way I always picture it is there was this TV show that Mom and I used to watch. It's called Gordon were Givens and what is it like the house on normal street or something like that but anyways there's there was this episode where the like very like um very like um analytical and it's happened to me right now i can't remember the word but um yeah she's like very uh like numbers based like super like intelligent very very intelligent girl character in the show um she like studies so much for a quiz show or like not a quiz it was like a yeah it was like a trivia competition or something like that um that she starts forgetting the names for like normal things or like forgetting like she forgets how to walk and she forgets how to, how to like she like she's like can you give me the inky righty thing like she doesn't remember how to say pen and like all those different things and like That's they funny you know like through magic and sort of things like they go into her mind and it's like this big box like filing cabinets and it's like um <clears throat> you know, like people are shoving like it's like she's shoving files in and then other ones are just like popping out <laughs> so that's definitely how it felt yeah 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 and i mean with with spanish words and all that sort of thing too so you were you're you were teaching your students english uh but your your first host family they, you're you're learning spanish from them you, uh your host mom didn't speak any english um so i i'm wondering like how much time during a day or, or during the week would you spend speaking english and how much were you speaking spanish like and and what was it like to to just be thrown into the deep end of the pool to oh, learn spanish absolutely yeah yeah i it's the best way to learn absolutely um being in another country because reg even though i was teaching classes in english i was in a school where all of the staff know how to speak english um and we had and like there's even like um several different americans who went to the church that i was at lots of like there were always people that you could speak english with in different places but just being in a different country where that's not the main language like everywhere you go majority of the time you're going to be speaking Spanish so if I get on the bus if I go to a restaurant like everything all of the atmosphere language is going to be Spanish um, so even just the fact that like the random little bits of conversation that you'll hear is going to be in that other language um, transportation like food labels and all that sort of thing like that's all going to be in that other language um it's yeah um so yeah the, the first family that I was staying with their most of their student most of their um kids um uh, had gone through the whole English program too so so we we spoke English and Spanish like pretty interchangeably I think um and then the second host family that I was with for the last six months that I was there um uh, they both speak English fairly fluently as well but um, that was, it was the understanding was like, okay, we're working on learning English. You're working on learning Spanish. And I would say at the beginning, we probably, well, not even at the beginning. Like we, by then, you know, it was three months in, I had gotten a little bit better with Spanish. And um, I would say we, we spoke Spanish like 80% of the time. And um, obviously they would explain certain words to me, but they would, that was the thing. Like, even when they were teaching me new words, they would explain them in Spanish, which is with other Spanish words that I could understand, right? Yeah. Um, and then if that didn't work, they would like look at it, we would look it up or they would explain it in, um, in English. And, um, but also like sometimes they would just switch to English, like they would just switch to English for whatever reason and we would be talking in English. But most of the time, even when they were speaking in English, I would try and talk to them in Spanish. Um, and then sometimes I would meet new people at different events and they would be like, say something in English. And then we would like talk a little bit in English. But yeah, by the by the end of my time there, I and that was <laughs> that was that was my bad sometimes because sometimes I, I spoke more Spanish in my classes than I needed to but it became a way to like connect with other people to like be like hey I'm gonna get on the same level as you it's like we're gonna literally speak the same language um to communicate better and that sort of thing and I started um 
having like whenever I had like extra classes if I was like tutoring somebody like that would be all in Spanish even if like the whole class we teach in English outside of that it's like okay we're here to make sure you understand so I'm going to explain this as much as possible in Spanish um so by the end of the time I was there I mean I would say like most of the day um maybe even closer to like 90 percent in Spanish um out unless I'm in class teaching right yeah yeah and and even and like you can tell in my social media too because <laughs> I remember the first time like an, a reel popped up on Instagram that was in Spanish and I was like wait this is really cool actually like I can understand this and I'm interested in this and this is another way to like interact with the culture right so I was like okay I'm gonna like it and like comment on it and share it and do all the things to tell my algorithm to give me more more stuff in Spanish and it works and now I think my my feed is like maybe 60 70 percent stuff that's in Spanish um well I I started calling you my Mexican daughter um because you're because uh to get updates about what you're doing you know I follow your 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 stories and then I'd have to like get the translation for 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 your, your stories yeah i started writing, yeah. writing those things in spanish my my mindset going into it was like if i'm gonna travel however like over two thousand miles something like that of a very far to a whole nother country um and be living in a spanish-speaking country which like not everybody has the opportunity to do and i'm learning spanish like, I might as well speak in Spanish. I might as well try my best, right? Um, and try and speak in Spanish as much as possible, like, up to the limit of my communication. Um, and and it was, it was, yeah, it paid off. I mean, I'm there's still a lot of things that I don't know how to say or, like, things that I just randomly don't understand sometimes. My pronunciation is wonky um, at times. That's when 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 you're bilingual you have this thing where you'll say words of one language with the accent of the other language or you'll like mix up the grammar structures or you won't find a direct translation for something and 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 things like that but um it's 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 just it's I think it's fun yeah more than anything I I thought it was it was fun and interesting and and learning the language was always my favorite part like yeah (laughs) What's one uh, phrase or expression uh, that, like, when you learned it, you were, like, excited and happy? Or, or, or it's, like, a favorite of yours? A favorite of mine? I mean, I think one of the first idioms that they taught me was hippie. That was, yeah, like, that was the one of the first, first things that I felt like, okay, this is, this is, like, specific and unique. And, like, when you use it, it identifies you as somebody who has enough understanding of the language, like enough familiarity. So GPI, stand, it's, a, it's an acronym. It stands for gracias por invitar. So it's like saying like, thanks for inviting me. It's, it's sarcastic. So, so let's say somebody, um, you're hanging out with somebody and they're like, oh, you want to go, you know, get ice cream now or whatever. They're like, oh, I'm sorry. I have, uh, I have a friend's birthday party that I'm going to. And you would be like, oh, happy. Like, oh, why, wow. Thanks for inviting me. Like, you know, yeah. Does that make sense? But um, <laughs> so, I mean, I don't, I don't use that a whole lot, but um, it was, it was one of those things like the first time I used it and everybody laughed because it was like so silly to hear this you know what what like little <laughs> american girl using <laughs> using that expression was like oh that's funny and the other thing is a part it's like pretty it's like it's like it's like slang it's very much like what young people or like people on the internet are using because i i've i've said it in some circles and like around some adults and they're like what does that even mean so yeah so yeah i i, I kind of like that um I'm trying to think if there's anything else like more in- like more interesting than that but um I mean a big one that people always bring up is por si las moscas um I don't even know how to explain that it means like for if the flies literally um but it's it's a way of saying like just in case um and it's just so weird sounding when you translate it to English I think that's why it's so fun because it's so different <laughs> that's fun so um uh We've talked about school. Tell tell me a little about uh, about the, the the church you went, were involved in mm-hmm. and and like the that community and and kind of your your part in it. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um. 
so yeah i i was on the worship team most weeks um and that was a really fun experience getting to getting to be on the worship team with with grant snodgrass who is a friend of our family um and one of the like ways that we found out about Noah in the first place so it was fun to like spend have that time together every week where we got to hang out um so yeah uh playing on the worship team I would play violin most of the time um and so uh, every once in a while I would sing but mostly mostly playing violin so yeah it was it was fun um to have that (laughs) I think I can I think I can tell the story I'll I'll, I'll ask some people if, if it's a lot to, to share it or not. Um, but it was fun playing violin because it, it's a conversation starter, right? Not a lot of people play violin just in general, especially not in Mexico. Um, so, well, I don't know if necessarily, especially not in Mexico, but especially in the city, like in that, like in that area. I don't know. I don't know what I'm saying, but um, it's, you know, it's not super common. And um you know, I would have people come up to me and be like, oh, you play violin. That's so cool. Thank you for playing. It sounds so pretty. And, you know, yeah, it's fun to, and then, you know, from then you're like, okay, so how did you, how did you join this church? Like, it was a good way to just like start the conversation and then, and then you can get to know people. <laughs> I also had um, a member of the congregation that shall rename, that shall remain unnamed. Um <laughs> that came up to me the first time ever that I played with this church um and he asks me to to if he if I would be interested in in giving up a presentation on Japanese culture in in his school and (laughs) for those of you who do not know I am not Japanese I am full I am mixed um like European, white American, and also Filipino and Cambodian, um, Vietnamese, but I don't think, well, yeah, not Japanese. (laughs) And that was, that was the two things I got most of the time when, when, when um, people would guess where I was from, they would say like, okay, are you, you know, do you have like Japanese, Japanese or Chinese? I had somebody who thought I was Korean, um, somebody who up until the last month that I was in Mexico, he thought that I was from there, but that I was Thai. And I was like, that's fun. Like, that's just fun. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> yeah. Cause he was like, I thought you were a student here, <laughs> but he also knew that I was a Mexican. So yeah, I don't know. And it's, and I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was a fun time. Like it was like, I can't even be mad at that. It was just, it was, it was fun because it was like, he was so excited about the opportunity to interact with a different culture. It just wasn't the one he was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you have ever have an experience where um, someone uh, at a shop or a restaurant um, uh, thought, thought you were Mexican? Um, I mean, I feel like, I feel like I, I, it's because people have told me different ways. Like some people have told me it's like, oh yeah, you look Fine. You, like you look Mexican, you blend in. It's just when you start talking that you can tell that it's like you're American. <laughs> and I've had people tell me the other way. It's like, oh no, like your accent, like you don't have any accent. You sound super Mexican. You just don't look Mexican at all. <laughs> so I think it just depends on the person. And also, there's such a big range of how of of how people look just all over the world, right? But especially like, I, I yeah, I mean, it, it's not like I wasn't. It wasn't glaringly obvious necessarily around like the middle of my of my time there because you know when I first arrived like I I, I was still wearing like my specific style of clothing that was yeah a little bit more like American and yeah just a little bit different and then and also like and also I had like really long hair that I would like braid most days um, and I just didn't talk as much in general so people would, would just assume I think um but yeah I don't know it, it really depends um a situation where somebody assumed that I was Mexican I mean yeah that there was that one student who because I would always hang out I I was a teacher and I it was like part of my responsibilities to go to um to go to the bible study in the youth group but I was not a leader there um I did share at at our at our youth group once um but other than that I was like 
I would, you know, like going there, um, unless you had seen me in a class or seen me teaching a class, like I was going there just like any other student. Right. So I, I think a lot of people like who I met, um, and made friends with during that period of time, like they just assumed that I was another student. Um, <laughs> I had to, <laughs> all sorts of assumptions in terms of age. Like that was fun. I, it's so hard to tell people's ages. Oh my goodness. But, um, I most commonly got either 15 or 22. Like people, people err. I mean, and people tend to err on the side of like you're older or you're younger. And that's like the range that they'll shoot for. But it was like very interesting that people, like depending on how they had interacted with me, they were like, oh yeah, you're definitely a high school student. Or they'd be like, you're definitely like an adult and a teacher. So yeah, I don't know. But those, those, those are both me, right? Parts of you. Yes. Yeah. But we got to start to wind things down. It's been a lot of fun, honey, to to hear about your your gap year. So, um, with that, I, I'm wonder. I I have two things I want to ask you. Um, uh, do you have any recommendations or advice for anyone who's thinking about doing a gap year versus jumping into college? And I'll have to have you back on the podcast to tell me about your your college experience. Um. Uh, and then the second thing, if you want to, um, I'm going to leave it up to you. If you want to speak in, in Spanish to any of your Mexican friends who might see the podcast, just a little message to them about how you're doing and anything you want to say to them. So, um, yeah. Okay. Suggestions for a gap here, please. Or, or anything you Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Um, if you are not one of those people who are blessed with um, a very clear vision for what you want to do with your life, um, and you like know for sure what you want to study, or you've like put in a lot of work in preparing yourself for independence, or you're just naturally super in independent or that sort of thing, um, if you're not any of those things. <laughs> Um, please do a gap year. I think it's a good idea. And and more importantly, choose the right place to do a gap year because um, the most productive thing about being working with Noe is that I was not, I know, you know, just factually, I was not the best teacher for that position necessarily. Not I was not the best person to fill that position, but I was willing to be the best, like willing to become like, what they needed, right? And they were there every step of the way to make sure I got to that point, to make sure I had the support to to um to to like, you know, give the instruction that my students needed and like be healthy and take care of myself and grow as well. Um the, I uh, your fellow teachers, the director there. Yeah, everybody. My church community, my host family. So yeah, I, I mean, host families, plural, because because what I learned about communication from living in, you know, living with different people in your family is super valuable experience. Um, best thing I can recommend is over communicate. Don't assume things, regardless of how easy it is to assume. Um, don't feel bad for asking questions. If they're making you feel bad for asking questions, like think about why you don't feel safe asking questions because you should always feel safe to like not know things like <laughs> that's the point is you're there to learn and, and improve right so yeah it's okay to not know it's okay to not understand and also sometimes in the moment it's okay to just sort of like nod along but um I wouldn't just let it go um you know find find the time to ask about it later if it's you know if it's something that you need to to understand um communicate communicate like oh there's no such thing as over communication please please talk about things please <laughs> and um talk about things before issues come up this is just in general regardless of what you're doing um so that way you feel safer um and like you have you know trust and like history to um or like prior experience to draw on when things are difficult or when there's a difficult situation because then you're not you're going to go into it like hey let's work on this together let's figure this out as opposed to I know that this is something I need but I'm afraid to express it because I don't want to like 
hurt the other person or like I don't know what this dynamic is like you want to have that understanding and and it takes work um and sometimes it's awkward it's always going to be awkward um if you're not a really natural naturally social person um and even including that please just understand that it is always going to be awkward <laughs> when you meet new people and that is okay do not give up because um that doesn't mean that you can't have have a good relationship there are definitely some people that I just went from like strangers to best friends very quickly and most of the relationships that I have there was that awkward period of time where it's like okay we don't really know how this is gonna go um but that's normal because we're you're, you know you're figuring out if you can trust somebody you're meeting a new person you'll you'll have to listen to your advice uh, uh, this podcast when you go to college next month Yes, I've been I've been repeating to myself this whole this whole summer. I was like, I've gone to a new place and met hundreds of new people before. I can do this <laughs> because it's like like I've gone to an entirely new city and entirely new culture before. I can do this, you know. Yeah, <laughs> in a foreign language. Well, so yeah, um, yeah, definitely, yeah. It, don't be afraid. Well, I'm not gonna tell you not to be afraid. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you not to be afraid to talk to people because that's sometimes unavoidable, but I'm going to tell you to do it despite being afraid. And it's okay to be upfront about that because everybody's a little bit uncomfortable. Um, some of the best interactions I've had with new people is when I've gone up to them and been like, hey, I don't really know how to do this, but making friends seems like a good idea. So, you know, who are you? Like, let's let's start with that. Um, and also this is hard and it feels weird because we don't want to be vulnerable with other people and we don't want to like impose, but I promise other people feel safer when you talk about yourself first, like, like give a little bit of information. Like, don't say, Hey, what's your name? Say like, Hey, I'm Grace. What's your name? Because then, then, you know, you, they have that, that sense of like, okay, you know, you give a little bit and then, and then people feel, yes. Yeah. 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 And, and you're not, and you know. People like like me who overthink things are like, why are you asking my name? What do you want to know? What are you going to do with this information, right? So, <laughs> and that's that's exaggerating, but yeah. Um, yeah, in terms of a gap year, like all of those things I talked about, um, figuring out transportation, communication, um, in some parts, finances. managing finances, um, managing your own time, you know, deadlines and that sort of thing, managing social life with work, boundaries um yeah um community versus family versus like neighbors and church and all of those different things that was all stuff that I that I improved and and learned about in while doing the gap year and it was a safe um and like healthy environment to do it in um briefly I but but I was curious about this um I, I didn't ask it earlier What's something that you learned about supporting or, or um, being there for people who are struggling, students who are struggling or friends? Mm, yeah. 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 And I think it's different as opposed to when it's a student versus when it's a friend. Um, for me, who I am, I am the counselor friend. Um, like, I really like being there for people and not just not not just giving them advice because, you know, I think I give good advice in some situations but mostly like just being there for other people listen being there when they need somebody to listen to them um when they want to, when they need to open up to somebody and feel listened to for me to be better at that was realizing that I'm not always the best person for them to talk to that I don't always have the information that they need or also just like realistically that I can't hear all of their problems and be okay myself too so sometimes the best thing to do was to like hear what they're saying and like um or okay I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself but sometimes the best thing to do was to say like hey you know like I, I want you to get the support and help that you need and um I think this person can really help you out and also like not being like hurt if they don't trust you enough to talk to you about their problems and they talk to somebody else instead like that's good like they talk to somebody like that that's the important thing they talk to who they, they needed to talk to. Mm -hmm. so, or right. somebody talk like yeah. the priority is them getting taken care of, not necessarily me taking care of them. And um, because, you know, there's that pressure, especially when you're working in ministry of like all of my, you know, little ducklings, like I need to be 
protecting them at all times. Like sometimes other people can take care of them too. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm not like insufficient, like it, it taking care of them. Um, yeah. And then with listening to people uh, and giving advice, I, I used silence a lot more. I, I got a lot more comfortable with silence, I think, because sometimes people are going through stuff and you don't have the words to give to them and that's okay. Sometimes they don't need words. Sometimes they just need somebody to sit next to them. And most of the time I had to rely on that. Or I, I, I found, I, I realized the power of that, I guess, because a lot of times when I was first getting to know people, I didn't know how to say what I wanted to say in Spanish. So I was just sitting there like, man, I have all these feelings that I want you to know, but I'm realizing like, you don't need more feelings right now. <laughs> You've got a lot of your own. So I'm okay with just sitting here and, you know, and yeah, I, I've had a lot of people, I've, I've, I've had a lot of conversations where I was like, I'm sorry, I didn't really give you any advice there I'm not sure that I really helped with anything and they're like no but I didn't I didn't need advice I just needed to be listened to and I feel a lot better and you know then they're able to make better decisions just because they have they're not alone in that you know they they feel supported regardless of of whether I did anything to like I didn't do anything to fix their situation I just mm -hmm, just listened so yeah okay so are, are you up to um Talking to your friends in Mexico? Yeah, yeah. Es que no sé, es que no sé si si ustedes van a ver esto, pero ay, es que se siente incómodo ver la así como directo. Pero este, um, pues ya saben que los extraño mucho. Um, gracias por todo lo que me me han enseñado. Especialmente cuando tiene que ver con, con el español y, y su cultura y, y sus vidas. Este, los aprecio mucho, especialmente porque... Mmm, especialmente los amigos que, que me acercaron. Porque sé que, que unos de, de ustedes este, conocimos en una, una manera así como como profesional. Ni tan, no tan casual y, y con otros este fue, fue o sea qué se quiere decir um, en una manera o sea tengo unos amigos que lo que yo yo fui para ustedes como un apoyo um, y también para usted hay hay muchos de ustedes que que me apoyaron a mí y pues eso eso es algo muy muy precioso y los agradezco mucho por eso porque sí o sea ese ese apoyo mutuo es algo algo muy importante um, con las amistades que no siempre había uh, experimentado um, sí uh, sé que es difícil seguir en contacto porque no siempre no siempre contesto los mensajes um, y especialmente porque ya casi me voy en la uni y no voy no voy a tener mucho tiempo pero pues uh, no se rinden de, de hablarme porque porque quiero 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 seguir este escuchando sobre sus vidas y, 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 y sí. gracias por todo pues eso esto no sería posible sin ustedes ¿eh? nice nice baby so um la, la, last thing um what's what's next What's next, and and what are some of your your dreams, and and, and goals now? Because it it's, it seems like it, it shifted and maybe changed, yeah, from your experience. Yeah, I mean, between music therapy and and psychology specifically, my goal has always been to help people with with my life, right? Um, that's something I'm good at and want to keep getting better at, um, and I think is worthwhile to do. Um, in terms of, yeah, dreams for the future, like more like short term, uh, I'm really excited for, uh, the group of my students who graduated this year, who are going to be a part of the, the exchange program this year, um, uh, or this, this upcoming summer, they're going to come, come to Oregon and I'm just so excited to see you guys, um, and see, see, um, so you have this brand new experience um 
and hopefully get a little piece of what um, going to Mexico was like for me um, when you guys come to the U.S. Because it's, you know, it, it changes your your life for sure to, to visit a different culture um, and to be that far away from home. And for a whole month, like a lot can happen in a month. So it's like... Yeah, it's it's such an exciting opportunity and I'm so proud of you guys for for how hard you've worked. So I'm I'm really excited to I'm really excited to see um what God, what God does during that time. How how God uses the um the all of the work that you put in thus far and um and how you're going to apply it when when you come when you come here, right? Um yeah, and also just because I miss you. <laughs> um, and then more more into the future. Um, yeah, I, w- I want to keep working with with organizations like Noi, um, you know, where you were uh, ministering to to youth, specifically like mentoring and discipling um, young people who are, you know, making their way in the world, trying to figure out their identities and that sort of thing, because those are things that we're were difficult for me have been difficult for me and um uh i i think it's really valuable and needed to um to to support and like build up um communities and organizations that are um helping people do that and and supporting them through that and you know showing people like you have potential and all these things here's a safe place to experiment um in 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 what you know maybe what you're interested in or what your skills are and learn new skills so that way you have more access to different opportunities in the future. Um, maybe, you know, ac- opportunities that you didn't have in the past. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely want to keep keep working with, with young people in that regard because I think that's a really important period of time to 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 be building those relationships and, and pouring into people's lives um and i really want to have a dog someday <laughs> wherever and however uh uh you know uh you you serve i i, I know you're gonna do a great job honey yeah and uh yeah i and i hope you you find the dog that that, that you like so Thanks, everyone, for watching, listening to this very special episode with my beautiful daughter, Gracie. Um, And usually I ask people about, you know, uh, about how listeners or viewers can follow on socials. But I don't know if you want to be doing that. Um, But if you don't want if you want to, like, I don't know, help uh, Grace achieve her goals, maybe um, I, I think um uh definitely in the future like if you do mission trips or or head back down to noe you'll probably do a newsletter so um uh if if you do that we'll we'll put a link in in the show thanks for listening everyone um i think uh one of the things you said is that it it's going to be awkward it's going to be scary but like do it anyway and, and so and so i was like when i said yes this is the courage uh this podcast is about courage and so that was a good description of being brave and, and being courageous so hope uh this conversation encouraged you um and uh uh feel free to write your questions and comments in uh uh, uh in the youtube or um on the facebook group Until next time, guys. Bye-bye.